Hello, and welcome to today's WCET webcast. Go ahead and get started here. Student Ready, Increasing Retention for Universities and Career Outcomes for Students. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. As we go through, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box. I will also be adding the PowerPoint slides to the chat box so you can download those slides. The webcast is being recorded and we will send out a link to the recording as well as any resources that are shared. If by chance we don't get to all of your questions that are asked during today's live webinar, I'll be sure to pull those out and get responses back from the presenters and share those as well. We tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel. If you'd like to follow along or ask questions there, the hashtag is WCET webcast. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box. We'd like to hold the questions until the presenters finish their portion of the presentation, and then we'll get to your questions. If I do see that there's a question that we need to address, I'll be sure to interject. I'm also the moderator today, so I get to wear two hats, and I'll be introducing our presenters. We have two wonderful presenters here today, Drew and Michael, and I'm gonna ask them to do brief self-introductions. Go ahead, Drew. Sure, thanks a lot, Megan. Great to be on today. My name is Drew Gant. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Wiseant. Uh, Wiseant was founded in 2005 as a tutoring marketplace, primarily for K-12 academic subjects, and since then has evolved uh, in a variety of ways, but most notably for this webinar, the majority of our students today are now post-traditional learners. And so we have a good amount of insight into those students in addition to that, we are also partnering with universities as a retention and student support solution. So looking forward to sharing you know, my perspective uh, today on uh, student ready. Great, thank you, and Michael. Terrific, uh, really, really pleased to be here. Uh, I am the co-founder of the Clayton Christensen Institute for Disruptive Innovation, a nonprofit think tank, written a number of books on the future of education, including an upcoming one in September called Choosing College. Uh, and I uh, am currently the uh, head of strategy for the Entangled Group and a senior partner with Entangled Solutions, uh, where I spend most of my time. Entangled is a group uh, dedicated to helping the education ecosystem move from being fit for the industrial economy to one fit for the knowledge economy, which squares up perfectly uh, with the conversation we're going to have today. Wonderful, thank you both. And I always like to ask a question to get to know our panelists a little bit better. So Michael, I'm gonna start by asking you first, what is one job you wish you had that you never had an opportunity to do? I always really wished I was like a farm ranch hand and never had the chance. Good one, that's a good one. I, I, I wish I had thought of that. I, I, you know, my snap reaction is um, I'm a horrible singer, but I am a musician, a pianist. And I've always been jealous of people who have a great voice uh, and so if I could be a singer, that, that, that would be the one that, uh, that, that I would choose. Great answer. What about you, Drew? Definitely not a singer. That would be the last one I would choose for sure. Um, when you asked a question a minute ago, which is all you gave us to think about this, my <laughs> first thought was basketball coach. Uh, basketball has always been my favorite sport. And I started as a, a tutor, and so I love interacting with – I would probably choose high school would be sort of my favorite age group. Um, I don't know how good I would be, but it, uh, I would like the challenge and the opportunity to, to work with young athletes. Great. Big basketball fan. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and pass it along to you both. So thank you for those introductions. Perfect. Let's get started. Terrific. Thanks so much. Uh, so really excited about this topic. Personally, uh, we all uh, Wise Ant and, and I teamed up on a white paper on this topic and, and really loved it because, you know, the reality is higher ed institutions uh, were, were, were not built uh, to be student ready for the types of students that we have uh, coming today. Uh, and so what, what we're going to do in, in the course of this time together is start with this question of what is a quote unquote post-traditional student uh, and really define uh, that type of student and why this is an important topic to be thinking about being student ready for that type of student. Second thing will be exactly that. Why is it important to focus on them? Uh, and then why are post-traditional students struggling to finish uh, college right now? 
in significant numbers compared uh, to the traditional quote unquote uh, college age population. And then the part that I'm really excited about, we're going to dig into solutions and we'll, we'll highlight four in particular of solutions that institutions can offer to actually increase post traditional uh, degree completion, uh, which is really critical as we enter this uh, uh, knowledge economy and increasingly uh, see the industrial economy in the rear view mirror. So we're really excited for this conversation. And we'll start it uh, on the next slide with, with thinking about why it's, uh, you know, what is this post-traditional learner? And post-traditional uh, was actually a, a term that was coined uh, by the late uh, John Ebersol, uh, former president of Excelsior College, uh, in a 2013 uh, American Council on Education uh, piece to, to refer to the millions of adults um, who already uh, are in the workforce, but they lack uh, a, a, a post-secondary credential of some sort uh, alongside their other responsibilities. And so, and, and these are people that are going back uh, to school, but, but don't have that credential even as they work. And so if you look at uh, the today's college students, they actually exhibit uh, on the next slide, a lot of these factors of what a post-traditional student might look like. Um, in 2012, uh, three quarters of undergraduates in America actually had at least one of seven post-traditional characteristics, which has come to be defined as uh, the seven being independent uh, for financial aid purposes, um, having one or more uh, dependents, so a child, uh, being a single caregiver. Um, fourth was not having a traditional high school diploma um, or to, a next delaying post-secondary enrollment. Um, it could be attending school part-time, which is a significant number of students, and then being employed full-time. And this chart, what it does, basically you can go around the ring and see, so for example, in the bottom there, employment, you can actually see the percent that are part-time employed, the percent that are full-time employed, which is 26%, uh, and then the percent that are not employed at all, uh, who are students today, which is 38%. And as you go around this, what you see is that three quarters of students exhibit at least one of these characteristics uh, that make them post-traditional. And, and Drew, when you think about this, you, you all obviously work a lot with these students. How, how has this uh, played into your own view uh, of higher education for, uh, as, as you've been interacting with institutions over the last several years? Yeah, it's shown up in our business in a huge way. And the majority of our business is direct to consumer. And it used to be even, I think, four years ago, 20% of our users would fall into this category. Today, it's, it's nearly 60% of the people coming to Wizen are in this post-traditional category, which reflects not only the growth uh, of that population, I think, but also the fact that their needs are not being met particularly well at their institutions and they're in some ways being forced to come out, you know, come to the private market and pay out of pocket for additional support. Uh, so I know we'll get, get a lot more into that here as we go. Yeah, it's a perfect segue, right? Cause uh, they, you know, on the next slide, you see that degree completion problem really put out there. And, and I think a lot of us in higher ed are familiar uh, with this first stat, which is that 60% of students uh, who enroll in college uh, full-time complete their degree within six years. But according to the Lumina Foundation, if you look at this number uh, for students with post-traditional characteristics, that drops to 30 to 35% uh, graduation rate. And uh, if, if you layer low-income students on top of that, so low-income students graduated roughly 10% uh, uh, within six years um, from college, which is just shockingly low rates as you start to layer on these other burdens of what it means to be a post-traditional student and trying to attend uh, college simultaneously. And that has huge repercussions, frankly. If you, if you go to the next slide, you can start to see that if you have a degree, uh, non-completion of a degree, huge gap uh, in terms of your economic returns. And, and so uh, particularly when these completion gaps disproportionately impact students who have post-traditional characteristics or are low income, et cetera, you see a widening gulf uh, of, of income returns, people that have bachelor's degrees or more compared to those who have some college or no degree. And the really interesting thing I always think on this slide uh, is that a lot of times we hear in the traditional popular media, if you will, pages in the New York Times and so forth, you hear a ton about the student loan crisis and debt and so forth. 
Um, but if you actually dig into the research a little bit more finely, what you see is not, it's not very uniform, despite the big sticker number of $1.5 trillion. The, the, big, the big amounts of loans that, that a lot of students take out tend to be when they're in graduate degrees and professional degrees for which there's a, a, a very clear return on investment that they'll be able to pay back. But the real challenge becomes actually on smaller dollar amounts in an absolute way, but for students often with these post-traditional characteristics that will enroll, take out loans, and then they do not complete as we've seen these statistics. And if you go to school, you incur debt and you don't complete, then you don't really get this uh, pay bump that you see uh, from, from having a degree and now you have debt on it. So you're almost worse off uh, than, than if you hadn't gone at all in the first place, which is really punishing for a lot of these students. And you, and you can see that if you flip uh, forward, we've got a couple slides that sort of shows these economic gaps. This one shows what happens uh, if you get a master's doctoral degree or professional degree, you continue to level up your potential for earnings, uh, but you gotta get that bachelor's uh, to, to get on that uh, road to begin with. Um, and then if you go to the next slide uh, as well, uh, you can see uh, estimates from uh, the Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce showing actual um, lifetime earnings that accrue to these different, uh, different strata, if you will, of, of earnings. And you can see this big gap between the bachelor's degree and the high school uh, diploma of nearly a million dollars, which is the one that people talk about a lot. But you see that gap between some college and, and no degree as well. Uh, and when you consider the loan payments that are going to have to happen on top of the uh, stresses of life for a post-secondary, excuse me, a post-traditional uh, student, this can be a really significant place if students don't, or a significant challenge if students don't graduate. So if we flip forward, that obviously begs the real question, which is why aren't post-traditional students graduating? What, what's actually going on here? Um, and it, it's interesting if you dig into it because there, there's a whole host of reasons that are non-academic uh, and non-cognitive in, in, in nature. Um, you know, a lot of students, they drop out because uh, life balance challenges, finances, uh, they have professional commitments while they're working because uh, a lot of these students are holding down a job at the same time. They might have a health event come up for them uh, or for a family member. Uh, they might have uh, a challenge um, with, with the institution uh, itself and sort of the way it streamlines in their life. And those are all challenges that come up while a student is enrolled. But if we look at the next slide, what you see is that there's actually uh, – a huge set of other factors that, that play into this as well, which, which we call readiness gaps uh, in essence. So students may have life intervened so forth, uh, particularly for these post-traditional students, uh, but they're also often coming to institutions underprepared by traditional definitions in two areas. And we broke them out as academic uh, gaps when they come to school. And then on the other hand, uh, non-academic gaps. And so if we uh, move forward and, and look at the academic gaps specifically, these are students who are simply unprepared for the academic uh, rigor that's going to be required in the university. And it's often the result uh, of overlooked foundational skills. So they've missed uh, core writing skills often or algebra and things of that nature. And we see in surveys that one-third of post-traditional students are unsure of their academic abilities, but uh, just to foreshadow one of the solutions we'll talk about, um, a lot of the ed reformers uh, in the K-12 world and higher ed world, one of the reasons they're really excited about competency-based learning, in which students only move on upon mastery of concepts, is uh, if you can put that in place in the K-12 education system, you could do a much better job of making sure students don't move into college until they've mastered core concepts and knowledge and skills and so forth. But the challenge is we're operating in a system where that's just not the reality. And so Drew, I imagine you see this all the time with students coming to you that, that you're serving uh, that have these academic gaps. Can, can you talk about sort of how that manifests itself in, in, in your own view? Yeah, I mean, essentially that's our business, right? We, we've done 10 million hours of tutoring nearly and, and uh, our business is, um, designed for students who have significant academic gaps. Uh, on average, 
students will work with tutors on WISAM for over 10 hours. So this is not a, a lightweight sort of homework help solution. It, it is very remedial in, in nature and high intent and high impact. So I, I think we have sort of some interesting insights into this category. Um, and as it says in the slide, by far the two most common areas where these gaps occur and where they come back to really hurt students uh, later on in, high, in their higher ed uh, careers is math and writing. Um, and math, math is, you know, there is a lot of algebra, but it, you, you'd be surprised how often people can sort of sneak by the algebra class with a passing grade without really learning it. So it comes back around again in statistics or in a science class where they have to back all the way up and, and really learn the algebra in order to do those advanced level classes. So, uh, you know, the majority of the knowledge gaps are there, but the, the close second is writing. And that's another one that, you know, people all always look, uh, think about math as a foundational skill that builds on itself. But writing is the exact same, and that'll also come up not just in a writing class, but in any of the advanced humanities classes, as well as science classes where you're having to write uh, research papers and, and, and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, for sure, uh, math and writing is, is where we see the, the biggest gaps. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, actually, just to riff on this for a moment, which is um, there's been some new research from a, a nonprofit called New Classrooms. They have a solution called Teach to One uh, in the K-12 education system, um, and not to sort of jump the train of, of stuff that they're going to put out there, but uh, they what they've observed is that uh, what they call the iceberg problem, that you exactly what you said, you may be able to pass algebra, but you actually have some pretty big gaps that are lurking beneath the surface that might go back to sixth grade, fifth grade, fourth grade even. Um, basic, just functional, uh, 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 you know, addition, multiplication, procedural things. But if you don't have those, when you get into college, it's not going to have, uh, traditionally speaking, you know, most institutions aren't going to have the support or ability for a professor to be able to go all the way backwards to fourth grade math you're just going to get overwhelmed and, and, and lost. And I, I'm, I'm imagining, Drew, that that's how these students are coming to you. They're, they're sort of reflecting that, that sense of loss. Is that, is that a fair, fair uh, uh, assumption? Yeah, totally. I mean, and it's, we'll get into this. It's not just the academic uh, portion of that, too, but there's a lot of scar tissue around these subjects that, you know, these students may not have done well even 20 years ago when they were taking, up, taking them. To the, so to think that they can pick right back up 20 years later, um, is you're starting off with a real set of challenges. Yeah, and I think it's a perfect segue, right, to the next slide, which is just showing that uh, this academic readiness gap disproportionately actually impacts post-traditional students. And so what you're seeing on this slide uh, is, is essentially where the readiness gap manifests itself most acutely based on the type of uh, post-secondary uh, institution. And so, uh, you see this in non-selective, more open admissions universities, but there's a huge readiness gap, as you can see in the bottom there, uh, and that, that's where disproportionately post-traditional students tend to enroll. And so that scar tissue, I, I think that's a, good, <laughs> that, that's a good phrase, right? It's not just that I came out of high school and I didn't actually have some of these foundational concepts. It's actually way worse than that, right, Drew? Yeah, so I, I went back just this morning to look at some of the qualitative insights um, that we have because all of the students and come to wise and will communicate with with tutors through our platform so there's a lot of rich information there and I was just just cruising through and here's some I pulled out a few quotes that I think capture this pretty well just little snippets the first was I saw a student say I haven't taken math in 20 years okay like that that could be sort of intimidating I have always sucked at math. This was a different student. So going in with super low confidence to begin with. And then this one, school was never really my thing. I think, I think is interesting there because there's probably a reason that generally speaking, these students never, you know, didn't go to college. If they were really prone to be super successful academically, you know, there's a higher probability they would have been in the traditional category. So, you know, they're, um, they've got sort of some tough, baggage that they're taking with them. And, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about this when we get to solutions, but um, there's a lot that goes into uh, building them back up. Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, and this is jumping a little bit ahead, but I, I assume some audience members are saying, well, we have our academic standards, we serve them or they don't, you know, if they're not ready, why are they here in the first place? 
the reality is for a lot of institutions right now, there are huge demographic lifts of the traditional student. There are huge needs in the economy of upskilling, and, and, and we see that just having a high school diploma or some college but no degree is not enough from the student's perspective. It's also not good enough from the uh, from a state perspective or from the nation perspective. And so changing how to operate to be able to work with these students is tremendously important. And that gets into the other gap that uh, are, are, are facing a lot of uh, uh, students when they come into these schools and, and schools are increasingly dealing with, which if we move forward one slide, is, is these non-cognitive gaps. And so this is the, the notion that students are unprepared in their development of social and emotional skills. And I actually hate the phrase non-cognitive gap because uh, these things are obviously rooted in cognitive uh, processes. Um, but but it's, you know, it's a phrase that, that uh, people who are smarter than I am use. So, um, uh, but non-cog skills cut across oftentimes subjects and disciplines. Um, and there are things, uh, you know, like uh, uh, academic mindsets or, or growth mindsets, sense of self-efficacy, um, behaviors such as class participation and engagement, and then having learning strategies like self-regulation or mnemonic devices or study devices um, and, and things of that nature. And non-traditional students are, are very clear that they're um, much less likely to feel that they're socially connected, supported by their peers, or have friends at school. And a large part of this is because they don't have uh, the grounding oftentimes in these mindsets and social emotional skills to know how to cut it. And, and there's been a lot of research about how uh, for, for some students when, you know, a bump in the road hits, they conclude, oh gosh, I'm just not college material, not realizing that students who maybe look different from them or are traditional quote unquote students, that they're also hitting those bumps in the road but they've accepted this as part of the narrative of what college is. And because they have a growth mindset, they're able to overcome these things uh, much more easily. Not so a lot of times uh, with these post-traditional students. And, and if you flip to the next slide, um, you see how these gaps sort of manifest itself in these large statements uh, that uh, non-traditional students or post-traditional students disproportionately make about uh, feeling like they don't have friends at school, feeling not supported by peers, lack of connection, uh, not feeling socially connected, not feeling like they belong, and so forth. Um, and it's a pretty stark sort of uh, picture. I, I, and again, Drew, I, I'm curious, because a lot of times when people think about tutors, they're not thinking about addressing these sorts of uh, challenges. H how does this come up with the student base that you work with? Yeah, well, one, one way one, one way these uh, users differ from other populations we have, it, you know, you can see in their behavior when actually searching for a tutor that I think speaks to this a little bit. Um, they do much more research on the tutor. It's, it's very clear that it goes well beyond, I'm just looking for a subject matter expert. It, it, they're looking for something much more than that. And in particular, um, you know, they, they tend to choose older tutors for one thing. Um, I think there's some amount of intimidation based on what we can see and when we research these users. Um, they're a bit intimidated by the younger generation. Um, they choose tutors who look like them and who they think have a similar background uh, that are from similar areas because um, they want somebody who can sort of relate to, to what they're uh, going through. Um, you know, the most common word we see when we do sort of verbatim analysis on, on these communications is patient. That's, that's what these uh, students need more than anything, um, is somebody who can sort of meet them where they're at. Uh, and, and so in some ways, you know, Michael, you made the comment that, um, you know, these, these students maybe, um, you know, aren't as self-aware or necessarily, but, but like what we see is actually a little different, which is that they know going in that they're, they're going to have problems um, and they're sort of turning to the university or to help them and they're just not getting that help. Um, so they, they're pretty, pretty, pretty on it uh, on the front end. Um, they come right out and say these things. They also, one of the other things they, they're very aware of is, that, and they, in some, some ways they're proud of it, but they also realize it's challenging, is they say, I'm the first one in my uh, family to go to college, um, which also suggests I don't necessarily have somebody that can help guide me through this process. Um, and so I think it all speaks to the, the social and emotional gaps. In a different environment, these people are probably totally comfortable, but returning to this academic environment where they were probably never particularly comfortable can be 
uh, pretty terrifying. Yeah, I think it's a good point. And if, if we move forward one slide, um, we, we, what we see is that these academic and non-cognitive skills in many ways are actually very intertwined, right? And, and that has to do with that academic uh, setting, I suspect, a lot of times. Um, but researchers have shown that non-cog skills um, can predict a range of academic and life outcomes from health and wealth to, to happiness. And some also um, have suggested that the reason uh, that GPA, your high school GPA, for example, is a much better indicator of your ability to succeed and persist uh, through college than, say, the SAT, um, is that the GPA uh, intentionally or unintentionally um, pulls in a lot of these non-cognitive factors. And so I'm just going to actually read one quote from uh, the University of Chicago Consortium on, on Chicago School Research, where the researcher said, uh, in addition to measuring students' uh, content knowledge and core academic skills, grades reflect the degree to which students have demonstrated a range of academic behaviors, attitudes, and strategies that are critical for success in school and in later life, including study skills, attendance, work habits, time management, help-seeking behaviors, metacognit uh, metacognitive strategies, uh, and social and academic problem-solving skills that allow students to uh, successfully manage new environments and then meet new academic and social demands. And I think that's a pretty telling sort of statement that, that, that sums up a lot of this. Um, but obviously, you see it all the time in your work with students around, around how these skills are, are directly linked to academic yeah, outcomes. Yeah, particularly the help-seeking behaviors. I hadn't seen that quote. That's a good way to put it. Like, we, we've talked about it as self-advocacy. Um, but I think it's in the same category. So when we partner with universities, um, you know, unfortunately, the students who need the support resources like the ones that we're providing are often the ones who don't feel comfortable or know how to reach out for help. And, uh, and they, they think in, that when we talk to them, they think it will reflect poorly on them or maybe even hurt their grade, which to us, you know, may seem sort of counterintuitive, but that's the mindset. Uh, and so instead, it, you know, it's the A and B students who are consuming the lion's share of tutoring and other resources. Uh, so it's just a, a really good example of how a non-cognitive sort of skill, such as self-advocacy or help-seeking behaviors, can, you know, directly affect sort of the academic uh, side of the equation. Yeah, totally. And, 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 and plays right into the... Uh... The question then, which that, that uh, we want to focus on, right, which is, okay, this is the frame of the problem and the challenge that institutions and students, frankly, uh, are facing. Um, so let's start to pivot now to, uh, you know, becoming student ready and the solutions uh, themselves. And, and I guess I'll, I'll put the question to you on the next slide, Drew, maybe. Um, when you hear this phrase, what does it mean to you um, to, to uh, you know, for an institution to become student ready? Yeah, so this has been a really fascinating chapter for me and for Wyzant these last several years as we've become partnering more and more with uh, higher ed institutions has given me sort of a front row seat to observe how higher ed institutions work and the things they are doing to become more student ready. And uh, some institutions are definitely making good progress, but uh, I, th you know, I, I, I was trying to take a, you know, really positive at, you know, look at this, Michael, and, and I was like, yeah, some, some schools are doing an awesome job at this, and you sort of put me in my place. You're like, to be honest, Drew, we're sort of at like the five-yard line, and we need to get to the other end zone here. Um, so you have a broader perspective than I do, but I think the point is we both agree there's a long way to go here. Um, and it's very clear we're in the midst, when we talk to universities, we're in the midst of a mindset shift where, um, you know, previously – and I think in my experience, there was some amount of uh, pride taken in, in a difficult curriculum. And, um, you know, the, the value add from a degree was uh, largely the, the certificate that, that showed you were able to persevere and complete. Um, but now I think universities are realizing that it's their job not to be a gating mechanism for who can get through and who can. It's to truly support students who come in many different shapes and sizes and with a variety of needs that um, for them to persist, they have to be addressed. And uh, the student, student has one job, which is to come and work hard um, and be committed to their academic responsibilities. But, but schools are realizing it's their job to guide them through the process and provide them with the support they need along the way, which is a totally different paradigm and one that schools aren't necessarily designed for. So that's kind of where we're at. 
Yeah, totally. And, and it's interesting, even if you take a larger, like, historical view of this, right, the education system from K through all the way through college, to, your, to use your uh, phrase, a gating function, it was designed exactly like that. And so a lot of the drop-offs that we see where, uh, you know, 20% of students don't graduate high school, that would have been considered uh, actually not successful because they would have expected to see a higher percentage of students uh, not graduating high school and just going directly into jobs. And then it was sort of high school was reserved uh, for the managerial class and the leaders of the uh, of, of society would be the only ones going uh, to to college uh, and then and then uh, leading society in, in, in sort of this wise Thomas Jeffersonian view of, of what American education should look like. And to your point, gating function is all well and good when jobs don't require right. uh, knowledge and skills, but we're living in an era where that's just frankly not the case. And so we have to flip this around and ask this student uh, ready question, I think, um, fundamentally. And, and so I, I guess that brings us into the uh, solutions. And we'll, and we'll start with, uh, you know, when we were framing up this paper, we, we thought of four um, solutions. The first one um, is this uh, question of uh, co-requisite um, courses. And, 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 the, and the basic idea is that historically speaking, um, we've had a remedial instruction in colleges and universities. So basically um, uh, students would enter, they would get some tests and if they were shown to be deficient uh, in say algebra, um, they would then get placed into a remedial course for college algebra or writing or whatnot. Um, although you brought up the uh, point earlier that writing is not just a discrete skill, it's something that actually comes across, the, uh, uh, across everything you do, which is a really important point. Um, but what people have seen is that actually it's a pretty blunt instrument that can slow students down. It means they're not getting credits while they are paying money uh, for these uh, classes. And so it's kind of a brutal, if you will, uh, uh, hammer treating every student as a nail when there's a lot more nuance uh, underlying what, uh, why students are struggling. And so a lot of institutions are at the beginning of replacing remedial courses with co-requisite courses. Basically students, uh, in need of support, still take a reg rigorous credit-bearing class. So they're in a traditional college class for which they get credit, um, but then they're paired with some sort of additional reinforcement. And that could be a small group seminar, one-on-one -on -one tutoring. It could be, uh, this is where you see some uh, online courseware with adaptive learning techniques sometimes used. Um, and there's been some good research around this. The City University of New York uh, found that remedial students um, placed directly in college level statistics alongside of having a tutoring or study group option actually did far better than their uh, counterparts in remedial classes. Um, and, and we're seeing this in, in a number of academic studies right now, uh, w w which I, I think is, is, is pretty exciting. I, I, I suspect you come across these sorts of students all the time, though, that in years past would have been placed in a, a remedial class. Drew. Yeah, I think, I think you've captured the the concept really well, if you take it from the student's perspective, I mean, just think about this picture we painted, you know, 10 minutes ago about this non-traditional learner. And then you think about trying to fill those years of knowledge gaps by dropping them in a remedial course for a few months and then thinking you can just push them into a, an unsupportive higher ed environment and they're going to be successful. It just doesn't really add up on its surface. And so uh, what we have to do is make the higher ed environment supportive. Um, but when you think about, when I think about co-requisite remediation, it's, it's like on-the-job training, um, which makes a ton of sense. But in that context, too, if you were to take an unskilled or inexperienced employee and just ask them to start doing their job without uh, mentorship and uh, peer programming or whatever it may be, whatever the discipline is, it's, it's not going to be successful. So, um, you know, and, and the other thing I would add, actually, if one of the benefits to this model, because in a lot of ways, that's what a tutor is. It's sort of like you're, you're getting the the co-requisite remediation as, as you go with a tutor. Um, it definitely hits on both the cognitive and non-cognitive pieces we were talking about because in real time, when you're going through an actual course, that's when you can learn the most about th the non-cognitive pieces of time management uh, and self-advocacy and, and study skills in, in sort of the, the exact right moment in time in a real world application. So um, I, I, this just makes the, you know, all the sense in the world to me, and hopefully it's a trend that, that continues. Yeah, it, it's been a fascinating, I'd say, a couple of years of studies around this question. We switched to the next solution. Um, also, 
a, a really interesting one that's one of my favorite uh, topics, competency-based uh, education. Basically, the notion that you award uh, credit as someone shows uh, mastery over uh, uh, skills, knowledge, co uh, competencies, um, uh, and that you move it away from the credit hour or seat time basis of uh, having students make progress, where you would sit in a number uh, in a seat for a number of hours, um, and uh, you know, for your credit hour, three credit hour course, and then move on regardless. Uh, here, um, because competencies can of often be tied. Uh, to the demands of the workforce. What's really interesting, I think, about it is you can actually start to grant credit for a student that's maybe been out of higher ed for, say, 15, 20 years. They might have already mastered a lot of key concepts that show up in a course or academic program, and they're able to show that on an assessment and just make progress, which I think is pretty, uh, is, is pretty neat, frankly, and it's a great way for a post-traditional learner that develops a lot of skills outside uh, of the academy uh, to, to, you know, to, to show this, right? And, and we're starting to see some institutions uh, increasingly move in this direction. So I'm, I'm curious, Drew, uh, you all must work with some of these institutions that, that, that do competency-based learning. How does it manifest itself from your perspective? Yeah, you know, the point you just made is really interesting because I think we see the other side of it. We see the students who have... Um, you know, all the other obligations and constraints of family and, and, and they, they actually need to go slower, right? But the point is that you're making is that actually a lot of times there's some synergy between their careers and what the skills they've developed. So I guess it works both ways where in some cases they can probably go faster because of what they've learned. But in other cases, in order to sort of work this in with their, um, their lifestyle and their other obligations, they, they just have to go a bit slower. And so it's nice to be able to flex it in both directions. Um, again, it goes back to sort of the comment that we hear all the time that they need a tutor who is patient and flexible. They also need a program that can be patient and flexible. Uh, so certainly, I think the competency-based model makes a ton of sense for this population. And, you know, when we work with competency-based uh, schools, Western Governors University being a great example, um, we see really tremendous fit and results when you couple that with a support resource like tutoring. Um, you know, we take a few courses, we took a few courses in their college of business that were notoriously sort of low completion in the 70% range and offered tutoring as a resource. And 20% of the students who it was offered to engaged with it, which is a tremendous engagement level. And similarly, um, the, you know, 20, there was a 20% improvement in, in completion rate. So I think it just goes to show the fit between somebody in a program like this coupled with, um, you know, a resource on the side. Yeah, no, it, it's terrific. And I, I think what's interesting is it is challenging for institutions to retrofit an existing program into a competency-based model because it totally goes against all their business model. But if you're setting up a new program, especially, say, an online one uh, or a blended learning program that maybe is serving explicitly these post-traditional students, to start from a competency-based uh, foundation and then move in uh, supports around that really exciting opportunity, I think, to sort of reinvent and reinvigorate the, uh, the, the academic model. Um, so let's, mo let's move on to that third solution then uh, around uh, sort of proactive uh, tech-enabled uh, advising systems. And I'd say, like, this is a solution that is getting a lot of hype, I think, right now. Um, it's fair to say, Drew, um, in, in, in sort of the market and people being excited, but it's around using technology to enable advisory services uh, to be available to students far more than it traditionally is. We hear a lot about nudging uh, and, and so forth in this. Uh, examples uh, from the University Innovation Alliance and Georgia State around some, I guess, good outcomes in these areas uh, from, 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 uh, from different techniques of, of uh, using things. Um, and then freeing advisors from, from sort of the manual enrollment tasks so that they can focus on the uh, higher leverage challenges facing students. Um, but I, I imagine you all fit in in some ways into some of these supports uh, for, from institutions that are starting to think like this. How, how does it play out? Yeah, it's an interesting confluence of technology and people in this category. And I think the distinction is that using technology to do the advising is probably, we're not quite there yet, but using technology to scale it and to handle all the administration around it uh, is it, sort of table stakes because otherwise it's not going to scale and you're not going to be able to use the, the highest order use of, of your human resources time. So, um, you know, a couple thoughts on, on this category generally. 
first, universities offer a ton of resources today. Um, there's, there's sort of no shortage of different programs and resources, but the challenge, you know, one of the challenges for these students is navigating all the resources. So that is kind of a key role of, of the advisor. Um, and, uh, you know, it's important to call out here that engaging students generally, post-traditional students particularly, who, who aren't sort of in the academic mindset or, or context or experience, and then the at-risk population, who are the ones you really need to engage to make sure they stay on track, is really hard. Um, they're juggling a lot, as we've talked about. So to think that you can send them a nudge or an email and, and then they'll they'll take the appropriate action it is not practical and it doesn't work. And I'm sure many of the people who are involved with universities and maybe on this webinar have seen that firsthand. It needs to be very personal. Thankfully, technology can help just like, you know, in the, in the marketing technology world, you can use technology to personalize uh, messaging. Um, it also needs to come in, in multiple channels and a human outreach is, is one of those ch uh, channels. You know, the other distinction here between technology and, and the role of the advisors is that the bots can't, <laughs> I think there's a State Farm commercial uh, about this, but the bots really can't be empathetic. And what these students need is somebody to, to lend an empathetic ear. And, and it's not a, you can't prescribe to them what they need to do. They, you, you know, you need to sort of coach them and help them understand how, how it works and how it's gonna be helpful and allow them to take the step in that direction. I mean, and this is all coming out of our experience in the last few years, um, where we, we partnered with a few universities and, and OPMs that have really robust advisory services and the engagement was through the roof. And so we thought, we thought oh, this is pretty easy. Like we should be able to get 15, 20% engagement at all universities. And then we partnered with a few others that did not have that proactive advisory um, level and, and, and we got no engagement. And so it was very, eye-opening to us from the beginning that, that you know, the human element is key here. Um, you know, the, I guess the only other thing I would add um, is that I mean, going back to the technology piece of this, um, the, the actual, because, you know, when you look at a school that offer, you know, runs their own tutoring program, which is great, and there's a lot of effective on-campus tutoring programs, but the amount of time that they're spending matching tutors and students or keeping track of hours, uh, or, or quality controls, um, you know, or reporting, like it's all very manual and it doesn't have to be, you know, that's the piece we have to use technology to do. That's what we've been developing obviously on our end, you know, for 14 years. Um, but we, we, so it's all about striking the balance between the two and using technology for what technology is good at and people for what people are good at. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's the right line. It's the right way to think about it. Uh, technology being, a, a good servant, but a terrible master. Um, so uh, I, I, right before we go on to solution four, just uh, again, for all those listening and uh, in, in the audience, uh, if you have questions for us, uh, start to cue them in. Uh, Megan is uh, curating them right now for us, uh, but just a reminder, because um, uh, after this uh, last solution, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be excited to take your questions. So as we move into that last one, um, this is actually the part that, um, got me so excited by what you all are doing. And I wrote about it for Forbes, obviously, after we did the white paper together. Because um, to me, uh, the, the fundamental structure of, of traditional higher ed just doesn't allow sort of for the personalization that a lot of students need, I think, and the flexible, deep, and ongoing expert resources that they need to help them wherever those gaps may emerge, whether it's an academic one or a social emotional one in unexpected places, and you, you might think they've mastered something and in a different context, they need help just, you know, sort of unpredictably. Um, being able to personalize within a traditional credit hour, you know, march through sort of structure is, is very difficult. And I was super excited by, uh, you know, seeing the power that you all brought of, of, of a tutor to this question. Um, I, I love, you know, your reflections on, on, on how institutions can leverage sort of some of these insights uh, around personalization uh, to, to you know, accomplish these supports for, for learners, Drew? Yeah, for sure. So this is the slide where I feel really most at home, obviously, talking about this solution in particular. I've been referencing tutoring as we've gone, but, um, you know, tutoring 
is by far the most effective way to learn one-on-one. -on -one. We've known that um, educational psychologist Benjamin Bloom, as it says on this slide, uh, did a very conclusive study in the 1970s and almost all educators will agree that one-on-one one -on -one learning and tutoring works. The challenge has always been, how do we scale it, both administratively and, and related to that from a cost standpoint. Um, this is the you know, solution that we've been building for 14 years uh, with 70,000 tutors, you know, millions of ratings and reviews. We figured out how to reach scale efficiently, and, and we talked about it. it's a lot, you know, using technology to, to manage what technology uh, can manage the search and the matching and the communication and the reporting and all those pieces. Um, but to scale it cost effectively is something that all of our institutional partners ask us about and, and are concerned about. And, and that requires sort of a, a, a lens that is, is one based on ROI and based on measurement. Of course, cost control is a piece of the equation, but the, the piece that matters more and you can get more leverage from is, is the impact, right? The, the R in ROI and um, you know, to, to do that requires pretty rigorous experimental, experimental design and, and measurement. And it's, it's been really surprising and frankly a bit disappointing that academic institutions where you know, the scientific method is taught actually don't do a good job of employing it on their own in their operations and their decision making. Um, if done right and if measured properly, tutoring should pay for itself uh, and then some. Um, but a couple of thought, you know, more specific notes on, on tutoring as a solution. Not all tutoring is, is the same, right? A lot of people use the word tutoring, um, you know, to describe everything from 10 minutes of, of homework help um, to sort of what we do on the other side, which is, you know, at least five or six hours of relationship-based sort of intensive um, remedial tutoring. So if you're looking for impact, you're not going to, you know, you got to be realistic about what 10 minutes of, of chatting at midnight before your paper is due is, is really going to get you. Um, of course, the cost there is lower too. So it's, it can be, you know, sort of people can be drawn to it, but you got to make sure you're measuring the R and the I. Um, you know, like I said, it, expect it to be five to six hours to get a, a student back on track on average. And the continuity is key. It has to be the same tutor. So just whether, again, if you're using your own tutoring program on campus, great, but make sure you, you're hooking the student, the tutor up for, you know, the duration of that engagement. And if possible, allow the student to choose the tutor because a fit matters and the student's going to know who, what, you know, the, the kind of more soft pieces that they need are the, the sort of non-academic pieces, um, much more so than any advisor will be able to um, sort of triangulate on. And then a couple final thoughts. You got to watch out for adverse selection. I, I referenced this earlier, but if you make a tutoring solution available to an entire population of students, it's the, it's the A and B students who are going to consume it, um, which is fine if your goal is to create a, like a wonderful student experience for everybody. But if your goal is to move the needle on, on retention and completion, you obviously need to get the at-risk students using it which again is a serious lift on engaging those students. It's not gonna happen um, by itself. And then the final point I'll make is just the very first word on this slide, flexible is key. Um, you know, a lot of campus-based programs are the campus tutoring center shuts down at eight o'clock. Post-traditional students haven't even opened their books at eight o'clock. You know, they're working much later than that. And they also, you know, they can't, they, they have kids that are sleeping, they can't drive to this, you know, like this uh, study center. So it has to be online, it has to be sort of wide hours of availability. Um, you know, and, and I think that that goes beyond just tutoring that that's probably true for all support resources that you're going to put around um, these non traditional post traditional learners. Perfect. So uh, let, let, Megan, how about some, uh, sh shall we take some questions? Great. Yes, we have a wonderful question, and that is, uh, do you know of good ways to assess if students are student ready when they enter an institution? Um, and, and sorry, so meaning how, how student ready the institution is and, and, and able to take multiple types of learners? Based I, from different I misread the question. It is how student ready a given institution may be. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I don't think there's a formal rubric, but Drew, I'd, I'd be curious if you guys look at it as you as you work with partners. But for my, I guess my off the cuff answer would be, I would want to say 
you know, what's the level of flexibility back to that word from the last slide. And, and I would be looking flexibility along all dimensions, um, meaning, you know, are you able to take into account life circumstances getting in a way for a student, uh, life balance, finances, health, et cetera, meaning that they have to take an interruption and you're able to accommodate them and bring them back without penalty. Uh, and then secondarily, um, but, but no less important, maybe more important, are you flexible around these different gaps from an academic uh, and social emotional perspective such that you can provide those supports and, and, and literally looking through the resources to make sure that flexibility. The last thing I would say is I think we're starting to see a very new breed very early on of, of higher ed institution come in that uh, is, is focused on, what, what's the right way to say it? It, it, like it sort of has this, we will support you no matter what mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a very different mindset. It's something that we've seen in the in certain K-12 charter schools, um, but it's a very different mindset for higher ed. It goes directly against sort of what Drew said in terms of like the traditional viewpoint of higher ed of like, we're actually trying to show you how many we can flunk because we're a gateway. Um, but sort of an attitude of like, we will do whatever it takes to make sure that you are successful here. Um, that's the other big indicator I'd be looking for. Drew, do you guys have a more scientific way of doing it? <laughs> I don't think I'd add, I love the question and I it just uh, kind of occurred to me to be great to have a measure, right? Like how, you know, we could, we should be able to sort of quantify how student ready a particular institution is. And it's, it's some relationship between sort of the, the enrollment criteria and then the outcomes, right? Cause you can't just take a super selective enrollment school and say, look, they have 90% graduation, right? They must be really student ready. It's about, um, the balance between those two. So I really, I mean, it's a, something that it'd be fun to, to um, kind of kick around a little bit more and think if we could try to capture that quantitatively. But I, I, yeah, I think Michael's answer is probably the best we can do for now. Right, and I think there's, uh, as you alluded to, does that then therefore, um, you know, we have, to, we have to teach the students we have. We can't teach the students that we want. So does that change the selectivity if that is a metric that we're measuring and evaluating on is sure we can be student ready if we have students that are ready to learn and are where they need to be for us to teach them. So. Yeah, you know, the SAT did something really, or the College Board did something really interesting today, right, was they released um, this idea of an adversity um, uh, score alongside the SAT um, to indicate uh, along a lot of these dimensions um, how much a student has not just not just a raw score, but give context to that score so you can see how much they've accomplished, how much have they overcome, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I see there's a question in there also about how much does cultural awareness relate for an institution to be considered student ready. And I, I think absolutely, you have to understand circumstances from which students are coming and which ones of those are important as, as, as you serve them, I, 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 would, would, would be my instinct. And I like Drew's idea of, you know, level of selectivity uh, relative to outcomes. Um, that seems like the right way to think about this ultimately. Mm -hmm. Drew, did you see the question in there? How does cultural cultural awareness relate for an institution to be considered student ready? Cultural, I did not. Maybe I don't know where to look for the questions, but I will. Uh, <laughs> I will <laughs> attempt to answer the question. So, can you repeat it one more time, Megan? Sorry. Sure. How does cultural awareness relate for an institution to be considered student ready? cultural awareness. Well, for sure, there is a giant demographic and cultural dimension to this whole equation, right? Um, there, these students cluster around, um, you know, certain backgrounds and characteristics. And um, I do think, you know, it sort of goes back to the point about students choosing tutors who look like them and who can relate to them. I think universities need to be, to be able to do the same thing. They need to be able to sort of understand and, and reflect back uh, where students are coming from and, you know, what they have experienced. And, you know, it all goes back to the, the, where we started, really, which is the university's job. Um, it's the university's job to support these students, give them the resources they need to be successful. As long as a student is um, doing their part and working hard and being committed. Um, you know, another thing that Benjamin Bloom said in his study is that uh, any student with the appropriate support can be successful. 
And I, I've seen that for 14 years. Um, I truly believe that to be true. So, you know, it's, it's easier said than done. But, uh, you know, hopefully, I, you know, certainly I think the outlook is promising. The, the conversations are beginning to happen. We still have 95 yards to go, but uh, hopefully we'll get there. Great. And I think we have time for one more question. So personalized learning is a big buzz word right now, and I think there's a lot of promise behind it. But why is your tutoring solution different? Well, personalized learning means so many different things. Um, I think has come become known to mean a lot of things. I will, primarily, I, you know, my what I've read, it seems to refer to like adapt, adaptive learning platforms where, you know, an algorithm can, you know, infer based on which questions you got right or wrong, sort of the right next question to serve you, which is great for a student that has, you know, a, a baseline level of, of uh, you know, understanding of the subject matter. But what we're really talking about here, you know, for a student that's at, at risk of, of failing out, showing them a more appropriate homework problem is not going to actually like uh, fill those knowledge gaps, right? So, you know, that, that's kind of, if you really want to put the, the person in personalized learning, and, and that's obviously the role of the tutor, that's when you're going to be able to go back and fill those gaps. Great. Okay, well, if there are other questions, please enter them into the question box and I'll be sure to share those with our presenters. Oh, here comes one. Do you have any, well, we do have just a couple minutes and then uh, I'll advance through these slides in the background that we have remaining, but I'd like to get to this question. Do you have tips on engaging students with the concept of taking notes and reading the materials prior to lab and rec lecture? I'm using CPAs or classroom preparation assignments. So tips for helping students uh, take notes and, and uh, read the materials prior. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, right? Because study, you know, some of these habits and skill, study skills are, are, um, are so fundamental and, uh, and often lacking. Um, the one thing we see is where beha behaviors like that are able to be modified is with some degree of accountability. And so, you know, that's, a, that's a, I mean, I don't, you can't, obviously I want to throw a tutor at everything. I know that's not practical, but I think the lesson learned here is that from a tutor student relationship, um, you know, comes, comes accountability, you know, we're going to have this um, session in two days and hear all the things I expect to see from you. And if not, we're going to sit there and talk about for an hour, why didn't they happen? So the, the, how do we take um, that model and uh, apply it to more broadly, kind of systematically, I think the, that, the answer would probably lie in there. I'm sorry, I can't be more, more specific. Sure, great. Well, I'd like to thank you both. This was a great presentation, and I really appreciate the dialogue and the discussion and the, um, the, the informative presentation. So that does conclude our presentation. I would just like to take a few minutes to share with you some of what's happening here at WCT. It's a very busy and exciting time of year here. We are preparing for our Leadership Summit, which is in Newport Beach, gosh, in just a few weeks. And do visit this website and look at the program. I think it's a very compelling program and it's uh, going to arm all of the attendees with what we're calling three stepping stone items that they can bring back to their institution and really start implementing some short and long-term initiatives toward building workforce partnerships. So I'm very pleased with how that program's come together and I think you'll enjoy it. Um, our annual meeting is coming up in November, but the program is going to launch in June, so we're also building that out, and I think it's going to be something you won't want to miss, so save the date. And again, we record all of our webinars, and we make them available on our webcast page, and those are all included with captions, so feel free to see what we have talked about. Um, we've had several wonderful webcasts this year already, and we have more on tap. I'd like to take a minute to thank our supporting members and our WCET sponsors that help underwrite much of our programming and events here at WCET and make uh, much of our good work happen. So again, thank you for being part of this conversation. Thank you to our participants and thank you to Michael and Drew. And we look forward to seeing you at future WCET events and programs. Have a great afternoon all. Thanks. <laughs>